Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Yalowitz, uh, the director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding, and uh, very, very glad to welcome you today uh, to a special occasion, uh, our class of 1950 lecture, uh, and it will be given today uh, by Ambassador Emmer Jones Perry, Sir Emmer Jones Perry, um, and I'll introduce him in just a moment. But I wanted to say just a word about the, uh, the Class of 1950 Fellows Program. Uh, it was inaugurated in the spring term of 2001, and members of the Class of 1950 were the first uh, to benefit from four full years of John Dickey's enterprise to better prepare students um, for future global leadership. And at their 50th reunion in the spring of 2000, the class presented a generous gift to the Dickey Center with the purpose, and I quote, to bring distinguished foreign leaders, scholars, and specialists to the Dartmouth campus for short periods to interface with the students on the important issues of the day. Class of 1950 Senior Foreign Affairs Fellows deliver a public lecture such as today's and are also available for classroom talks and for more informal discussions with students and faculty. And Ambassador Jones Perry will be spending a very busy week uh, meeting with a number of classes and student groups, uh, I'm very, very pleased uh, to say. Now, uh, some background information on our very distinguished guest. Sir Emmer Jones Perry is currently president of the University of Wales, Aberystwyth, a post he assumed following his retirement last August uh, as the UK permanent representative to the United Nations. Sir Emmer was educated at Cardiff University and St. Catherine's College, Cambridge where he received a PhD in polymer physics. He joined the Foreign and Commercial Office, FCO, in 1973, and during a distinguished career has served his country internationally and provincially. His public service career began with the British government in the Foreign Office, a position that took him to posts in Canada and at the European Parliament in Brussels and Madrid. He was the Foreign Office's European Union Director during the 1998 United Kingdom Presidency of the European Union. From July 1998 until August 2001, he was again the FCO Political Director. In 2001, he was appointed UK Permanent Representative on the North Atlantic Council, NATO, uh, which was followed in 2003 by his appointment as UK Permanent Representative to the UN New York. And I can tell you as a former diplomat myself, when you've been your country's ambassador to NATO and the United Nations, that is a very, very distinguished career. In 2007, following his service for his country abroad, Sir Emmer was appointed chairman of the All Wales Convention, a body established by the Welsh Assembly Government to, re to review Wales constitutional arrangements, and it, in particular, to spearhead the campaign to increase the powers of the Assembly to a full legislative parliament similar to the Scottish Parliament. That same year, he was named President of Aberystwyth. I also want very much uh, to welcome uh, today uh, Lady Lynn Jones Perry, who is the Vice President of Cardiff University in Wales and the wife of Sir Emma. We're delighted to have them both. And also one other thing that I would like to do um, is to ask the members of the and their spouses of the class of 1950 who are here, uh, David Taylor, Joe Medlicott, Jack and Jilly Harned, um, Doug and Meredith Smith, uh, 
Nuke Nukem if he is here, and Sal Sally Edridge, and Jim and Peggy Strickler if they're here as well. But would you please be recognized? Our, we are very grateful to all of you. And uh, now I'm very, very delighted uh, to give the uh, floor to uh, Ambassador Jones Perry, who will speak about a multilateral journey, the changing nature of the European Union, NATO, and the United Nations. Ambassador Jones Perry. Well, Ken, ladies and gentlemen, it's a particular pleasure to be here in Dartmouth College in the idyllic surroundings of Hanover. And my particular thanks to the class of 1950 and their representatives, indeed, for making it possible. Public diplomacy increasingly is part of the life of a diplomat. My colleagues in New York would spend lots of time off making speeches hither and thither, and one had a particular reputation the drop of a hat, he could deliver 30 minutes on the future of the United Nations. <laughs> Went off one night to deliver a speech yet again upcountry in New York. His driver said, what are you speaking on tonight? Not the future of the United Nations again. He said, yes. He said, you know, I could deliver that word perfect myself. <laughs> so the ambassador said, OK, they don't know me in the destination. <laughs> You can deliver the speech. I'll pretend to be the driver. So when they got there, they changed roles. The ambassador sat at the back quietly. And the driver, word perfect, delivered this immaculate speech. <laughs> Unfortunately, the first question was a real sod. It dissected the whole premise of the speech and put down a counter proposition. And the speaker said, you know, that is such a dumb, stupid question. I'm going to ask my driver to answer it. <laughs> well, there's hope, because that was going to be a test as to whether the audience had a sense of humor. Because <laughs> my wife's advice is consistent. Try and say something amusing at the beginning, end with something witty and preferably the minimum space in between. <laughs> well, like many people of my generation, I've been privileged to spend most of my lifetime in a continent characterized by peace, stability, democracy, and usually of growing prosperity. In the second half of the 20th century, the development of the United Kingdom was shaped not just by domestic institutions, but also by the emerging institutions of Europe, the transatlantic partnership of NATO, and the international instruments developed in the United Nations, including, of course, the Bretton Woods institutions. Each was in some way a product of a shared European and American determination not to relive the horrors of the first half of the 20th century. Each has played a crucial role in British foreign policy through that last half century. My professional career, you gathered, has been dominated by multilateral work, a journey that took me eventually to the United Nations, but via NATO and some 20 years laboring in the vineyard of the European Union, sometimes a little bit barren, but laboring. Now, Webster's Dictionary and I'm not sure if it's the same Webster, I suspect not, but <laughs> defines pilgrimage alternatively as a journey to a sacred place and a tedious, wearisome time. Now, few would dare to describe the current European Union, UN, or NATO as a sacred place. But many of the colleagues I work with would readily identify with the second definition that sometimes it is tedious and wearisome to spend the hours one does actually locked in what used to be those smoke-filled rooms, trying actually to hammer out agreements, produce treaties that scarcely seem comprehensible even to those of us who were trying to negotiate them. 
And I'll put in there the one test that diplomats should always do, which is as you're coming towards the end of whatever you're trying to achieve, just step back from it and ask yourself, have you actually managed to do what you set out in your objectives to do? You can get carried away by the fun of the game very easily. And the net result is if you, what you end up with does not do the job. Now, I want to argue that the three institutions I'm talking about have been essential to the secure, prosperous, and free development of our countries. Moreover, those institutions which have dominated Western Hemisphere politics and policy over the last 30 years, and which have each undergone and are undergoing very substantial change in their own particular journeys. The EU, NATO, and the UN, they share many common values and objectives. They're committed to the maintenance, the promotion of international peace and security. The principles of justice and international law to economic, social, and humanitarian cooperation and advancement. The members of NATO explicitly affirmed in the charter of NATO itself the commitment to the purposes and the principles of the UN Charter. They unite not only for their collective defense, but also to promote democracy, individual liberty, the rule of law, stability, and economic development. In turn, the members of the European Union, they confirm their attachment to the shared principles and their respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. They resolve to reinforce their European identity in order to promote what? Peace, security, progress throughout the world. Now, why do we need multilateral institutions? Is there a country today which can divorce itself from the currents of what's happening in the outside world and actually go it alone. In the United Kingdom, we had in September, for the first time in 120 years, a run on a bank. We had a very substantial run which necessitated the British government putting in support to the tune of $50 billion, which is quite a lot for a small bank, and it was all because of the subprime crisis in the United States. The SARS epidemic in China some, what, three years ago, led within two weeks to deaths in Toronto. Avian flu, environmental issues, they respect no national boundaries whatever, nor do terrorism or migratory flows of people. Climate change, increasingly accepted in the United States as being mostly man-made, actually threatens the whole of humankind. It demands a global response. As individuals or as societies, in order to best fulfill our potential, actually working together to overcome those global threats and challenges is always going to be more effective. An agreed international framework remains, I think, the best approach to try and tackle them. And the corollary of that is that the risk of breakdown of conflict, of isolationism, is that you fail to harness the whole of the communities in order to tackle the problem. And that cooperation is as necessary internationally as it is within a state to try and tackle national problems. Finding solutions to any of these issues, and many more, requires states to work together, to promote their national interests and objectives through the multilateral approach, in which you have to understand the interests and concerns of other people, put yourself in the shoes of the other person, and then try and find a solution which meets your own objectives, but at the same time is acceptable to all. That's the essence of accommodation and agreement. Accommodation, compromise. 
They're not dirty words, but they are essential if the international system is to work. I see no reason for apologizing for trying to get agreements which actually meet as many people's interests as possible and are therefore more likely to stick. Enforcing agreements on people is as much for nations as it is for individuals, not a solution to be recommended or one which is likely to work. Now, the three institutions have their origin partly in the failure of nations to turn the growing prosperity of the end of the 19th century into stable and democratic orders at the beginning of the 20th. In Europe, industrial revolution and economic growth failed to address increasing inequalities, marginalization, discrimination within states and between states, and the perennial rivalry between states was not addressed. So that in the early 20th century, those factors tipped Europe and subsequently the world into two catastrophic wars. Now, driven by enlightened self-interest and the growing memory of those wars and the harrowing experience of them, European visionaries strove in 1945 and later to try and rebuild the continent, but to, out of the ashes of destruction to produce something which would be stable, to have cooperation instead of rivalry and animosities, and try a process of building a common future for Europe. Hence, the start in 1953 and later in 1957 with two other treaties, that there were three new communities in Europe. Started with six countries and the United Kingdom, along with Denmark and Ireland, joined in 1973, and the six became nine. Now, by any measure, the evolution since then, over 50 years of the European Union, has been a conspicuous success. Conflict within our borders is unthinkable. Armed aggression, virtually impossible. The battles we have now in the Council of Ministers are about the prices of agricultural commodities. They're about transport policy. They're about how we respond to environmental issues. Democracy and prosperity have been consolidated. The European Union has given its citizens more choice. More wealth has been produced. And crucially, there's been security and stability across the continent. And I think I want to argue that the European Union has been successful particularly because it was not a single-minded attempt to establish a federal state, although sometimes presented as that. Instead, it's been practical cooperation between nation states. States accepting a degree of supranational legality, a degree of cooperation, but doing so where they believe there's a common purpose to actually work together and where common goals can better be achieved by actually passing things across to Brussels and to the European Union. But at the same time, national interests have been defended and the crucial position of nation states secured. And throughout all that, there's been a continued partnership although fractious at times, with North America. And increasingly, this European Union has been a force for good. Collectively, we are the world's largest trading entity, a primary source of direct foreign investment, the largest donor of aid by a long way, and we're working together on global challenges to promote democracy, human rights around the world, to try and better protect the global environment and to tackle issues like illegal immigration, organized crime, drug trafficking, terrorism, and so on. Areas where we believe that collectively 
we can better work together, and where indeed, if you don't work together, you can't do it separately. A simple example, that if you want to control the flow of money to terrorists, there's absolutely no point in the United Kingdom believing it has the world's best, tightest regulations, if in fact five countries out there have no regulation whatever, because money, like water, always finds the weakest path. So net result is you have to do it together. And that's what I believe the European Union is trying to do, and trying also to develop a role in preventing conflict in this world and developing a peacekeeping state-building responsibility where conflict has actually ended. That means in the Kosovos, in Bosnia, even today in Congo and Afghanistan, the European Union, working with NATO, is trying actually to deliver a better position for those countries. But crucially, trying to do so in a way which respects the position of NATO and its primary responsibility for territorial defense. Because if the European Union has undoubtedly contributed much to security in Europe through political and economic development, it is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, that kept the Europeans free from external aggression during my lifetime. It was the United States underwriting the NATO alliance that deterred the threat of invasion from the Warsaw Pact or annihilation from the nuclear arsenal of the then Soviet Union. You should always remember that simple fact, the tremendous advantage to Europeans and North Americans alike of their political and military relationship within NATO. But of course, by 1991, everything was changing. I remember discussing with colleagues in the Foreign Office what was to be the future of NATO. After all, the Soviet Union no longer existed. Who was the enemy that NATO was out to defend against? Now, in the intervening years, America and the Europeans have worked together militarily. Our armed forces have been restructured away from static defense towards a global expeditionary possibility. And we discovered that by reaching out and working with the newly liberated countries of Central and Eastern Europe, that military cooperation and dialogue has actually helped to stabilize those emerging democracies. NATO's Partnership for Peace today embraces 24 European states. However, improbably, from Ireland to Uzbekistan, countries committed to working together with the NATO allies to build peaceful cooperation and reinforce democracy across the swathes of the European continent. At the same time, Americans and Europeans also discovered that in the Balkans, the old Europe of borders, of bloodshed, and ethnic atrocities was still with us. That we could rely on peace perhaps within the European Union, but actually the challenge outside was intense and could only be addressed if we worked together. Even more recently today, we're learning the capabilities of the European Union working with NATO on a common European security and defense policy that draws its political inspiration from the European Union, but actually much of its military strength from the NATO dimension. As with the European Union, the evolution of NATO has been very pragmatic rather than some grand design, but always anchored on the precepts of the original founding charter. An Atlantic alliance designed out of necessity to ensure the defense of the European territory. And today it has an additional and crucial, crucial vocation to deliver stability, not just on the continent, of course, but to reduce threats ever more widely from the Balkans to Afghanistan 
today. Just remember, ladies and gentlemen, that the peace we enjoy is in a large measure because out there, other people are fighting to preserve that peace for us. And that applies tonight in Afghanistan and lots of other theaters. Now, the United Nations was the other great vision born out of the ashes of the Second World War. But soon after its establishment, of course, the Cold War deprived the UN of its central role in enforcing international peace and security. Instead, the superpowers' deterrence policy, mutually assured destruction, might have maintained East-West peace but it rendered the Security Council powerless to prevent the wars being fought in Africa, in Asia, and in Central America. Despite, or perhaps because, of the paralysis of the Security Council, the United Nations and its agencies became ever more identified with work in the economic, social, and humanitarian sphere in advancing international development <coughs> and in establishing and promoting human rights. As with the European project, this was a slow, painful process of establishing areas of mutual interest, identifying where international action was more appropriate, would produce that added value, and then agreeing how it should be done. It's produced an intricate and complex structure of agencies and intergovernmental cooperation. But if the success of an organization is to be measured by the number of countries that aspire to and belong in it, then a UN which went from 51 in 1945 to 192 today, virtually universal in its membership, then clearly it has something to be said in its favor. But there is considerable skepticism around, particularly on this side of the Atlantic. I worked with some of the biggest United States skeptics in the United Nations. I happen to think that it's an endeavor which we have an interest in its success, and we should be trying to actually make it work. So I don't share the doubts, because the achievements of the United Nations are numerous. The end of conflict in Liberia, it's the UN that's putting together the pieces, trying to tackle child soldiers, what you do about the status of women. How do you repair a ravaged economy, a political system that doesn't exist? How do you apply and get a rule of law and some sense of justice? If the UN were not putting together Liberia, who else do you think would do it? And today, there are 20 United Nations peacekeeping operations in different countries doing just that with 100,000 peacekeepers on the ground, trying to recreate states, trying to put an end to conflict and build peace. Smallpox has been eradicated. Polio, almost. UNICEF, renowned for its work with children, in 123 countries today. Child mortality rate still an abomination, but half of what it was 20 years ago. Safe water now available to 1.3 billion more people since the early 1990s. 30 million refugees looked after. There are 23 million refugees in this world today, again, who cares for those if the United Nations doesn't? But moreover, the activity of the UN and its agency is an integral part of the international economic order. We take it for granted, but there is hardly a facet of economic activity which in some way or the other is not regulated by some element of the United Nations. That applies to intellectual property, to the World Trade Organization, air travel, food safety. I could go on at great length, but the UN and its agencies are part of actually trying to make sure 
but economic activity takes place safely, well, and easily so that economic growth is developed. Now, since 1989, much has changed. The fall of the Berlin Wall, the implosion of the Soviet Union, has turned effectively the multilateral order upside down. It's produced new challenges for the three organizations I've described. Enlargement became perhaps the most successful policy of the European Union, certainly a major preoccupation, but also for NATO, as it too evolved in its role. The United Nations gained 16 new members. And many welcomed this new world order as the NATO-led coalition went into action under a Security Council <coughs> mandate and then removed Iraqi troops from Kuwait. But that honeymoon was short-lived. We watched the horrors of Bosnia unfold. And finally, acting together in 1999, we liberated Kosovo through NATO forces actually getting on the ground in July of that year. Europe was reminded, and it did need reminding, of its continued dependency on the United States. In the Balkans, as in parts of Africa, ethnic tensions rather than political ideology drew the lines of conflict. And then 11 September turned our world upside down again and put terror linked to religious extremism right at the top of our agenda. NATO was united after 9-11. It invoked for the first time on the 12th of September, Article 5, collective self-defense. But events then, I have to say, moved to impose greater strains on our multilateral institutions and raise questions about their future. Now much has been said and will continue to be said about the Iraq conflict what it did for the United Nations, the transatlantic dimension, and even for the European Union itself. I'm not going to revisit those arguments, but the world today does look rather different to what it was 15 to 19 years ago. Our multilateral institutions, like our national behavior, has had to adapt. It will continue to need to do that. We're going to need more rather than less multilateralism in the future. And having spent a career working in this field, what I'm confident of is that the necessary changes will be made, if too slowly. But the journey will enter into new stages. Let me remind you simply, the European Union today is 27 countries. NATO has 26 countries. The EU went from 6 to 9 to 10 to 12 to 15 to 25. And then finally, and if I'd suggested this in a, an address here in 1988, you'd have thought I was really quite mad to suggest that Romania and Bulgaria would join the European Union. Of those countries, 10 were under totalitarian regimes in 1988, and six did not even exist. Now, had there been more students here today, I would have said, of course, that most of the students were born after these events. And the risk is, of course, that we have no folk memory whatever of what the situation was before 1989. And as we see in the banking profession, when we lose a folk memory of events and of experience, we tend to pay for it. We would do well to remember the challenges we did confront and why we have to be eternally vigilant lest they reoccur. And that, I think, is the, the big advantage of these institutions, that we're in a position at least to ensure that cooperation is the way forward. The three tending to do it together. There's an EU peacekeeping force in Chad at the moment waiting for the United Nations 
to take over responsibility. It's been doing so with cooperation from NATO. Tackling terrorism involves the three organizations playing their part. Not that there's any simple answer to combating terrorism. But what is clear that any organization in a position to help tackle that scourge should do so, and that the more they can do it together, the better. And as I speak, real progress is being made in the Balkans, thanks to massive political and economic support, and now military participation from the European Union, but working with NATO in Bosnia, in Kosovo, and a police force from the European Union working under the protection of NATO forces in Afghanistan. When, almost five years ago this month, I proposed in the North Atlantic Council that NATO should go to Afghanistan, it wasn't greeted with universal support at first. But the simple realization was that the sterile debate whether you were in or out of theater owed nothing to the challenge you were confronting. When it came down to it, if Afghanistan was to be tackled, then it was the countries of NATO who were best placed to do that, and frankly, there was no one else. That's why NATO is there today. These common themes, the preservation of security, the development of democracy and the rule of law, and enhanced economic prosperity for citizens are fundamental not just to the three organizations, but they are the essential elements of a state. If you look at Iraq, Afghanistan, Liberia, you name it, unless you have security, unless you have some prospect of prosperity, and unless you develop democratic institutions and the rule of law, that state will not prosper. And very simply, you have to tackle all three from the earliest possible moment. There's no sequence in this. You can't get security right and then assume you'll address what you should do about the economy. If you're a child soldier who had a Kalashnikov and you take it away from him, if you've got nothing to offer that 12-year-old, and if you think you're going to reabsorb him into some sort of society, no chance. And unless you have stable institutions where people have a stake in their own societies and in their own decision-making, then again, there's no prospect of success. Now, what does all this experience suggest are the essential skills for a diplomat? And there are a number of people present who can comment on what I'm about to say, perhaps, in questions. But I suppose the first one is the quality of diplomacy, the statement of the obvious, to try and look happy when unexpected guests arrive. <laughs> to make people feel at home when actually you wish they were. <laughs> A capacity to make the right response. When I was in the embassy in Madrid, the local paper, El País, phoned three ambassadors and asked, what would you like for Christmas? My ambassador was very pleased and saw the item on the Christmas Day edition wasn't so pleased when he saw what it said because the US ambassador wanted peace in the Middle East, the Russian ambassador wanted an end to nuclear weapons, and the British ambassador, he wanted a box of Belgian chocolates. <laughs> it's the capacity to find the right word for the right occasion. Um, and very important for those of us who practice in the English language because so often, English is the language in which everyone is working, and the expectation that the Brit will produce the right word. Now, in the 16th century, some monks in Britain were exquisitively and painfully slowly copying out the Bible and doing it, these religious tracts, with great detail, precision, but very slowly. And in year three, one said to the abbot, he said, what if we made a mistake with the first edition, the first version? Don't you think you ought to go downstairs and check with the master copy? So anyway, the abbot went down, didn't reappear, and eventually when somebody went to die and looked for him, they found him there 
beating his breast and shouting, the word was celebrate. <laughs> A bit slow there, if I may say so. But you know, handling the press, um, more and more vital for a diplomat, to ensure that the word is succinct and that it's not capable of being misinterpreted by the sub-editor. There is absolutely no point when the headline has emerged in saying, well, if you read what I'd said and that particular sentence in the context of the paragraph and the page and everything else, you'd have realized what I was trying to say, it's too late. Every sentence has to stand individual scrutiny. I mean, at the height of the Cold War, the British and Soviet ambassadors were, um, one challenged the other to a 100-meter race in the the margin of this international conference. They had their race. The British ambassador happened to come first. And the headline in the British newspaper was, British ambassador beats Russian. In his vestiaire, it said, ambassador's race, Russian second, British second to last. <laughs> That capacity to willfully misinterpret <laughs> is very much present. Let me come back to the serious stuff. The, the way ahead. The European Union needs to take two factors into account in digesting its historic expansion. First, it has to address the potential alienation and fatigue among its own citizens. Those who no longer contrast their liberty with totalitarianism, that's no longer the threat on our doorsteps. And where tolerance is undermined by fears of economic recession, religious extremism, patterns of immigration. Secondly, it needs to resist the tendency, which is always there and accentuated in present times, to look inward and instead what the EU has to do is keep a firm eye on the external role to actually play its part for global stability, not only in economic and social issues, but also in terms of the political and the military aspects of life, and to do so in the closest and most active participation with North America, particularly the United States. There's absolutely no merit in defining a European policy by its automatic opposition to what the United States thinks. That's why, for the United Kingdom, the transatlantic and EU partnerships are complementary. They're not competing. But, of course, it becomes uncomfortable if the two policies at either end are 100 degrees different. The onus, then, on all of us, including the United States, to work for policies which the other side of the Atlantic can understand, sympathize with, and cooperate on, quite basic. And NATO is central to that transatlantic partnership, the defense of our shared values of freedom and of democracy. The enhanced European defense capability which the United Kingdom and France have argued for, should strengthen our ability to intervene to work with the United States, provided that the Europeans actually deliver. And at the moment, there is scant evidence that they're doing that. But in areas where the United States doesn't want to take the lead militarily, and where it's not appropriate for NATO to act, it will be necessary for the European Union to do more on the external side. The examples in Congo, in Aceh, in Indonesia, bear evidence to that simple fact. But if you go and robustly try and impose some degree of order, require people to cooperate together, then you're going to stop conflict before it breaks out. And the EU has to do more on that. For its part, the United Nations has to speed up its internal reforms and react better to changing conditions. That requires more delegation 
by the member states to an accountable Secretary General, much better service delivery, and agreement to policies which actually address the issues of the 21st century and don't repeat the really the sterile arguments and fixed positions which have bedeviled the UN for the last 20 years. What I don't see is too much evidence among the group of 77, a misnomer because there are 133 countries, but I don't see within them a willingness to actually tackle the issues that need to be done. Strengthening the effectiveness of economic and social work, quite crucial, particularly in the pursuit of what we call the Millennium Development Goals. What I mean by that is reducing further by 50% child mortality, maternal mortality, crucially, but providing that every boy and girl in this world should have a chance at least of primary school education by 2015. In most of Africa, that is not the case. Providing fresh water and, above all, trying to tackle poverty. Bearing in mind that more than two billion people today live on less than one dollar a day. That's the scale of the challenge out there, and it has to be addressed, and we have to live up to the commitments we've made. And some of us who haven't made quite enough commitment, I hope they can rather increase their contributions too. Because it's indispensable to rights, economic development, political progress, that actually we do tackle these issues, that we try and avert conflict, and that we do better on post-conflict reconstruction. It also includes, of course, what do we do about the Security Council of the United Nations? which needs to be reformed, but needs to, to retain its ability to act decisively and to take decisions, be they on issues ranging from East Timor to Liberia, sadly, to Myanmar today. We need better to try and define our collective interpretation of when can the international community act, when is it right that the interests of a nation state and sovereignty should rather be modified in the interests of the international community, but especially when governments are not defending their own people. If people are put at risk of genocide and sadly even of natural disasters, when can, should the international community act? We don't have enough agreement, consensus, that we are prepared to do that. And finally, we need to tackle comprehensively what do we do about the threats of global terrorism, weapons of mass destruction? Because on the one hand, tackling poverty, inequality, and injustice can deny terrorists the fertile ground for recruitment. But on the other hand, what we need is being prepared to back hard multilateral diplomacy against those threats with the use of force if it's necessary if all other options had been exhausted. Our predecessors built multilateral institutions to empower us to tackle problems that couldn't be contained by national borders. The institutions they built in the aftermath of the Second World War are the tools of our collective security and prosperity today. They remain, for me, as valid now as they were in 1947. I'm a believer in the multilateral approach. However imperfect it may be, and it's very imperfect, but it brings together more and more the work of these organizations for shared objectives, which in the end make us all much better off. But what we have to remember, finally, is that the institutions we create are only as good as we allow them to be. Too often, it's easy to blame institutions for inaction when the real failure is the lack of political will by nations. Multilateral institutions shouldn't be made the scapegoats of a national unwillingness to act. 
because they do provide, albeit imperfectly, a framework for that action. But it's more often than not, it's the failure of nations actually to empower the right multilateral response. Thank you very much indeed. Let others make that judgment. Um, I came into it, I'm tempted to say by mistake, and I feel in the wrong form, but that wouldn't be the reason. It was because I did a lot of student politics in the 60s, and by the end, politics attracted me rather more than physics, if I'm honest about it. And I also came out of university at a time when universities were retrenching, and academic prospects in physics just didn't exist. So I was attracted. My luck was that I fell into a job which I loved and which involved the same set of principles, trying to identify the problem and trying to find a solution. The difference was that, as Einstein said, physics may be very difficult, but politics is quite impossible. <laughs> uh, but there we are. But if I study polymers, it's polymerization is where you bring together molecules and you try and make one rather effective large chain molecule. I suppose that could be a training for multilateral diplomacy. <laughs> yes, sir. Sir. Um, the students are obviously getting younger. <laughs> immigration is a big issue in North America. To what extent is immigration restricted in those 27 countries of the EU? Well, within the European Union, uh, when we expanded from 15 to 25, three governments, the British, the Irish, and the Swedish, um, imposed no limits on movement from other member states. All the others put in place transitional arrangements. So 12 of the existing members had transition arrangements for the new 10 countries. We didn't, and we got a flood of immigrants. Um, and uh, the figures are disputable, but something of the order of 600,000 people came to live in the United Kingdom. And the truth is, on the whole, um, we've deprived the sending countries of talented people because the ones who were prepared to move were the ones who had initiative, in many cases very well qualified, and we've benefited from it. The immigration from outside is something which is a common issue, challenge, shall we say, for all of us. And the number of asylum seekers in all the member states of the EU is at a record level. Um, for us in the UK, um, we're trying hard to get to a point where we're asking to leave as many people as are applying for asylum in any given period, and we're not quite managing that. Because asylum, much needed in terms of the 1951 provisions, has become something which is being used for economic purposes uh, and is not genuine asylum. That's, that's part of the problem. But it's also the case that in the Somalias of this world, how many refugees do we have now from Iraq? Um, there are a large number of people in this world who are in desperate straits, and they're working their way around into Europe from all sorts of different routes. I'm trying to make sense of that and trying to get a common policy when nations say it's something we ought to sort out for ourselves, but yet you can't keep it on a national level, it's a major political issue, it has to be said. But it brings with it some of the most pernicious of crimes, and that is the trade in people. And the trade in people into the European Union is much greater than it ought to be. Um, and the conditions under which people are trafficked um, it's another occasion I'll use the word abomination. But it applies also in the United States. And if I said to you today there are probably 300,000 people trafficked into the United States each year, 
you'd be surprised, but it's of that order. And if I told you that in Southeast Asia in the last five years, 10 million people have gone missing, and that from the Ukraine, something, as the ambassador knows, something of the order of 300,000 people have also gone missing in the last five years. Again, trafficked for the most appalling of prospects. It's something we all have to tackle with. So don't imagine it's a phenomenon which is just the United States. Um, it's happening to all of us. And the last statistic I'll give you is that the uh, movement of people between developing countries is greater than from developing countries to the developed. Um, and if you look at today the problems that the neighbors of Iraq have, I mean, they're phenomenal. And the efforts they're trying to make with UN agencies to look after people who are migrating, most as refugees, but trying to tackle those problems. It's, it's one of our biggest challenges. Yes. How long do you think it will take for the Security Council to accept uh, nations like China and India? Well, China, of course, is there. Um, since 1971, China has taken the seat. Um, India and whether or not, and the British policy is clear that we would like to see Japan, India, Brazil, Germany, and two African states become permanent members. Um, I see no prospect of it happening. No prospect. And the reason is very simple, that you put together any grouping of countries and say, that's the proposed charter amendment. It requires a two-thirds majority in the General Assembly. It's not countries like the United Kingdom using a veto, not at all. It's the failure to get the two-thirds majority. And the reason you can't get the two-thirds majority is very simple, that in any grouping that's put together, there will be sufficient countries outside who object to somebody within the grouping, but they won't support it. And for as long as that happens, I, I see no scope for changing it. There may be some fudge where some of these countries will come in on a, a longer basis rather than a two-year rotation. Maybe there'll be some new five-year membership. I could see that happening. But new permanent membership, um, I just don't see how it could happen. Yes. Um, how do you see the Lisbon Treaty, uh, reform treaty for the European Union, modifying the role that NATO within the European and uh, within the European Union. How do you see the increased uh, cooperation between the European, among the European Union, changing the role of NATO to be um, Well, I'm glad you... Uh, let me try and repeat the question then. The, the, there is a, a treaty amendment, a massive one, to amend the treaty provisions of the European Union which also says a little bit about defense. And the question is, how does that impact upon NATO? I was afraid you were going to ask me about the treaty itself, but which is a, <laughs> a, a law unto itself. One of the, um, how can I put this? One of the Republican supporters currently working in the defense field said to a friend of mine, not knowing it would come back to me, said, you know, I hate Jones Parry. I will never forgive him. And the reason was that I was the idiot who wrote what became known as the Saint Malo Declaration between France and Britain, setting out a defense and security dimension for the European Union. But I then ended up ambassador to NATO, trying to give effect to that. And I've always been consistent, and my answer to you is that what we want to do will not impinge upon NATO. The reason? NATO has to retain responsibility for territorial defense. Article 5, an attack on one, an attack on all, put simply, has to be NATO. If you want to deploy the international community into eastern Congo, if you want to provide security, deliver humanitarian assistance, try and promote democracy, the rule of law, try to cope with the post-conflict traumas that exist, there's no point sending NATO. But you can't just send police because you have to protect the people you send. So if the European Union says, we'll do a package and we'll cover all those issues and we'll put troops on the ground, 
I don't regard that as in any way threatening to NATO, but I regard it as a defense of international order. Where it becomes more difficult is if the EU is going in to do something which is rather stronger and requires a greater military capability. And there, the structures we set out provided for NATO to actually do the planning and for the deputy supreme allied commander to be the commander of that EU operation. I even number two soldier in NATO would command the EU operation. That's provided for. And where you are in serious areas like that, and when it's clear that NATO doesn't want to act, i.e. that the United States doesn't want to act, that somebody does it. But bear in mind our problem isn't that we're all willing to do expeditionary forces around the world to tackle these problems. Our difficulty is that when it came down to it, governments were not prepared to act. So when you saw that Bosnia blew up in the early 1990s, but Sarajevo was allowed to be under siege for 13 months, and that nobody had the courage to take on Milosevic militarily, <coughs> or that Rwanda happened, then you have to ask, where are the leaders, and where's the capability and the will to do something about it? Don't cavil at institutional arrangements, but actually put your money where your mouth is and tackle the problems. And I'd say the same today about Myanmar. Yes. Um, you mentioned the success of the EU, and I was wondering what your opinions are of the similar multinational organizations emerging elsewhere in the world um, that are trying to imitate that kind of success, especially in Southeast Asia. I'm not sure to what extent ASEAN is trying to imitate, because the degree of supranational um, within the ASEAN 10 states is, is nothing like the same. But the increased cooperation, starting at the economic level, coming on to political cooperation, I think is desirable. As long as all of us remember that we can't just stay in little blocks, but that blocks should speak under blocks and to nations, and that the reason you have a global arrangement of 192 states in the UN is that when it comes down to it, to tackle these issues, we all have to be involved. There's no point having a World Trade Organization limited only to the EU and to ASEAN. We've all got to be there. And in the same way, if you're tackling terrorism, I want to see everybody part of that same struggle. So yes, the scope for cooperation is there and to be encouraged as long as it doesn't lead to introverted isolation within a group, which is why I ended with a plea that the European Union should be outward looking, cooperating with, and a force for liberalism and not for protection. Yes, in the back. You two fellows, yeah. Whoever wants to go first. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's, a, there's a microphone on your right. So much of the, the 20th century British experience was characterized by a halting acceptance of the, the European Union and increased integration in Europe, and perhaps a, a lack of assurance about the, the special, special partnership with the United States. So I was very curious for you to, um, to talk a little bit about what you see as maybe from Brown's government going forward about the importance of the, the special relationship with the United States and to what extent um, you think the United what extent you think London will uh, will look at that versus look at um, its obligations to, to Europe? Well, Tony Blair was very clear that there were two major relations for the UK, but he ranked them and said the first one is solidarity with the United States, and secondly is what we do in Europe. Absolutely no uh, problem in his mind with that. And he said there was no problem either because the two were not inconsistent. And that is true for as long as the policies pursued by the United States and the EU are congruent. But when they start differing, you find yourself in a very uncomfortable position, period. Um, I didn't use the phrase special relationship, and I've never used it. And the reason is very simple. In all the organizations I've worked in, I've never spoken about the English language. Other people say, of course, 
English is going to prevail and it's the language which everybody will have to use. And I keep my mouth shut because more and more that's what people are doing. But if people like me say, of course you must speak English, the German will put up his hand and say, I want the German language, etc. Let the market take care of it is my policy. And in the same way, the special relationship, if it exists, and I think it, to a considerable extent there is a particular relationship, if you go out advertising to the world that your relationship is special, all you do is upset somebody. And it's arguable that other countries have a more special relationship with the United States than we do. A former British ambassador wrote recently, a former British ambassador to Washington, that in his view, Israel, Saudi Arabia and Ireland had a closer relationship than the UK. <laughs> I'm not commenting on that, <laughs> but it may have reflected his time as ambassador, I don't know. But um, better by concrete action to demonstrate what you're doing together. Now, as far as our um, not wholly convinced British view of the European Union, yes, we've gone up and down, up and down, um, mostly down. And there was a referendum in 1975 whether we should stay in. That was comprehensively two to one in favor of staying in. Um, now, the question about the Lisbon Treaty takes me back to what that should have been as um, the governments of the EU um, first agreed it, and that was a, a constitution for Europe. The British government accepted it, but was never comfortable with the word constitution. And more to the point, in France and in the Netherlands, in referenda, they said no to the constitution. Hence the need to have a Lisbon Treaty, which the British government says is so different that they don't need to have the referendum they committed themselves to having, <laughs> but which most observers on the continent say it's actually the same thing, but we're calling it something else. Um, I leave others to judge on that. But if there were a referendum today in Britain, I suspect it would be two to one against membership of the EU. And if you looked at a number of other countries, especially the Swedens, the Denmarks of this world, um, they probably wouldn't come out convincingly in favor either. And the fact is that the graph of that favor of the EU against time as soon as you join, you're up there, but very quickly it falls down. And it's happened to every country that's joined. Because it's very easy to criticize. I, you know, I could go on for great length about the efforts to straighten bananas. We should only sell straight bananas and straight cucumbers. And you can pick on absurdities, most of which are not true. But public opinion is very malleable. So if you want to start that sort of campaign, it's much easier to criticize than it is to set out the arguments. What I've tried to do as a practitioner is set out the case for today. But it's warts and all, and there are lots of warts. And if you focus just on the warts, you won't come out in favor. That's the problem. Yep. Yes. Uh... Hello? Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm here. Um, uh, with regards to your recent work in uh, the future of the Welsh Assembly, uh, do you view the uh, international organisations, particularly the U European Union, as having a role to play in reducing tensions, for example, between London and people in Scotland, Wales, mm. Northern Ireland? <laughs> the, the great tension in the UN is between... Um, Nations like my own and people like me who argue that there's a limit to sovereignty and that actually, despite what it says in Article 2.7 of the uh, Charter of the UN, that actually you should be free under certain circumstances to interfere in the affairs of a sovereign state. That was recognized in the outcome document of the World Summit in September 2005, where there was a hierarchy First priority of tackling genocide, whatever, is for the member state. The second one is for the international community to help the member state to do that. And thirdly, if neither of those were successful, then it would be for the international community to act appropriate with international law to try and tackle the problem. 
Now, if I'm talking about Myanmar, I will wax semi-eloquently as to why we should do something. If you'd said to me 20 years ago, should the United Nations get involved in Northern Ireland, I would have said, not on your nelly. Um, and that's the hypocrisy of my argument. Now, I happen to think that in the case of the question you're asking, um, there isn't a need for any international involvement because we're, what we have is a natural process um, where devolution is taking place. Scotland has its own parliament. For the first time in 200 years, laws will be made in Wales, which affect Wales. Contrary to the introduction, I'm not out there to canvas for these powers. What I'm out to do is to explain the powers, the case for a transfer of substantial gains to Cardiff, to understand the arguments against, to measure what the capacity requirements are of being able to enact law and apply law, which is nothing like as easy as it looks. Um, people seem to think that you know, all you need to do is have a wee meeting, pass a... Law's not like that. And the draftsmen in Westminster reckon it's a seven-year um, apprenticeship for a very skilled lawyer before that person can actually draft legislation. Um, trying to do that in a way which then produces law which is accessible, transparent, understandable, and can be applied is what good law for me is about. And I'm not sure that the devolved administrations yet understand that. So we'll see how it goes. But there's a process of trying to explain to the man in the street in Wales what exactly is potentially available is a huge challenge. Because when I, I thought I followed these things reasonably well until I started reading the Government of Wales Act, which was passed in Westminster in 2006, and I found it totally incomprehensible. And I think there are probably 10 people in London and maybe 10 in Cardiff who understand it, and that's it. <laughs> and that's the subject of a referendum if they decide to call one. And that's not a basis for a referendum. So there's a lot of work to do. Do you see any solution to the Cyprus problem? And if so, would the international community be involved? I know they've tried. I do see a solution, and the solution came very close yeah. two years ago when a deal was on the table, and if it had not been, in my view, willfully misinterpreted and argued against by the then president of Cyprus, then there would have been a deal. Uh, but the fact was that traditionally Denktash and the Turkish Cypriots had not accepted any accommodation. This time around, the Turkish Cypriots did, but the Greek Cypriots were encouraged to go the other way. And if any of the three previous presidents of Cyprus had been actually still in office, they would have argued for that deal. And what's interesting is that the new president has now decided to try and follow a path of accommodation. But the, the issues are complex, but there are only about five of them. And if you sit down and examine what you do about territory, about governance, about troops and security, and a few other things, it's capable of an answer. The problem is that you know, Aphrodite smiled on the island but not on the people who are put actually to live on the island together. <laughs> so. No, I think my wife's giving me a row for that comment, but I do happen to, I, I do happen to think it's true. Yes, what should uh, the European community and the world community should do about uh, Tibet? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I start on the basis I think Tibet is part of China. I don't see Tibet as being separate. So it's a question of what over time one can do to actually get in China greater respect for rights, greater devolution of political responsibility, and something getting closer to some form of democratic structures. And how one does that, I'm not at all clear, if the economic progress that is China leads us to a path of economic liberalism, huge discrepancies in wealth, etc., and still in a country where you know, it will meet the Millennium Development Goals, 
because of the huge level of growth and prosperity that's come to many. But in the countryside, not so. China's going to have to balance out those things and produce within its society more equality, more prosperity for everybody. And if that economic freedom follows any other model, it will lead to political freedom, and Tibet will get solved in that. What is strange, though, that what's happened in Central Europe, for example, um, it's not happening in China. So you have this great imbalance between political and economic freedoms. And the Chinese model appears to allow that. But I doubt whether in the end, as we saw in Central Europe, you can suppress people's innate wish for freedom. You can't always and forever suppress it. And at some stage, I think it'll emerge. That might take a century. Well, you know what? Um, I'm not sure which Chinese leader was asked what did he think of the consequences of the French Revolution. And quite recently, and he said, it's too soon to tell. <laughs> <laughs> so it does depend on your time scale. I'd like to ask. But I think there's a, oh. a student, or two oh. students on our left, I'm sorry. Um, thank you. Oh, you, you, you. Uh, 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 <laughs> I thought I was being generous with the description. <laughs> a mature student. Yeah. Yeah. I identify with this. Um, I have a problem, very uh, broad question, and that concerns uh, the way you describe the benefit of multilateralism and cooperation in this institution was very much to come to agree on the instruments and the solutions to given problems. But I, I was wondering to what extent is it actually to come to find an agreement about what the problems actually are. And because that seems to me that a lot more difficult um, task of what is going on with most of these institutions is that actually they don't agree on the problems. Um, so maybe could you give an example of that as, as, as the key issues that are being really I think in response to the first question, how on earth did I end up where I was, um, in talking about what one does professionally, um, a key bit of it is to identify the problem. Because I don't see how you can really try and sensibly find a solution without knowing what it is you're addressing. Um, but working through that to what is the solution is part of the process. Um, but I agree with you, the, the failure of understanding uh, is all too obvious. Let me give you... I labored for days in the bowels of the UN building in the run-up to the summit because I had the, uh, the great privilege and dubious pleasure of being president of the European Union in the second half of 2005. So I was speaking for the EU in all these meetings. And one breakout session was on terrorism. And I wanted a simple statement to say that we condemned terrorism. And I failed. And I failed very simply because the UN has 12 conventions on different aspects of terrorism, but it has never defined terrorism. And we haven't defined it because there isn't agreement about what it constitutes. And classically, in the case of Palestine, most members of the UN, that is a majority, will not accept that what the Palestinians do constitutes terrorism. They regard it as being legitimate resistance against an occupying force. It becomes then very difficult to, to try and bridge that position. But I said in my initial comments, one of the important things is to try and put yourself in the feet of the person you're actually negotiating with. So if I go back to, say, 1942, and I'm somewhere in occupied France, and the resistance blow up a car with four Gestapo members, is that terrorism? And I would not say it's terrorism. I'd say, well done you. Huh? But if you were sitting in Berlin at the time, you'd say it was terrorism. And that's, I'm afraid, is the legacy that's left over. And it's why some of these problems are intractable. So I agree with you, it would be wonderful on terrorism if we could get the condemnation. But so many people say, ah, but what about the causes? Now, I start them very simply, but there is no cause, in my view, that justifies terrorism. But other people do not agree with that. 
And that's a part of the rich challenge for this multilateral diplomacy. Please. Yeah, although I have to be quite clear, it, it's a very difficult question. It's difficult for the question, the reason of national sovereignty, etc. It's also difficult because how do you get the resources on the ground to do the job? And you are dealing with a regime which for 60 years has subjected its people to the most awful conditions, which has no respect for human rights whatever, and yet if in 1945, as we were looking at independence for countries in South Asia, most people would have said, well, of course, the country was going to take off soonest is Burma, because it has very nice, talented people, and it has huge resources. So what we have today is a nation which has been repressed, which, as you saw in the putting down of the monks' rebellion in the autumn of last year, a brutal and cynical attack by a government on its own people in really ruthless efficiency to suppress all um, challenge. That's, that's what you're dealing with. And you're dealing with neighbors who, A, espouse no interference, but actually in economic and political terms are interfering all the time because they're taking great swathes of Burma and using it for their own economic development. That's what's happening on the ground. So in the middle of all that, you say, now what do we do? Well, part of what you do is you get the UN agencies up and ready for it. And because of a British initiative about two years ago, there is a $500 million fund available. So the resources are there to provide the, what is needed on the ground. And there are four city, or four areas of the world where the UN has all the equipment it needs for local emergencies. So from Brindisi in Italy, this stuff can get out there. The problem is, what happens when it gets there? You've got to do the diplomatic with the government and try and do that route. But it needs to be a far stronger element of what you do with the ASEAN countries who are part of the same association and whose aid would be better received and put aside for now labels as to where it comes from. But again, what sort of regime is it that shows photographs of aid being delivered, handed over by military generals, pretending it's national aid when it's come and been stolen by these generals for their own purpose, and which actually leads last Thursday with the news that says the leadership has sent a message of congratulations to the new president of Russia, and has a five-minute item on that, and doesn't mention the plight of its own people? Against that background, what would you do? Uh, this question of responsibility to protect, when can you interfere, was specifically written in terms of genocide, crimes against humanity. We didn't think about natural disasters. And as I said before, I don't think most of the UN members agree with what they signed up to anyway. So what would you do? I'll tell you what I would try and do. I would put down a Security Council resolution which would say very simply, calls upon um, all the UN agencies to do the maximum, etc. calls upon all countries of the world to give every support to that, and then specifically urges the maximum cooperation by the Burmese authority and goes on to say that if necessary, a UN presence and such countries as are prepared to do so would have all necessary measures authorized under Article 7 to deliver that aid. That would mean that I'd be looking for, as the, the Americans have yet again, as they did for the tsunami, uh, vessels ashore, you know, just off the coast of Burma who could deliver some of that aid and whose helicopters, etc., are the only way of doing it. I would have them authorized to do so, and I would challenge the Russians, the South Africans, the Chinese especially, 
to actually veto such a resolution. South Africa can't. The other two could veto, but if they're prepared to veto such a resolution, then they should be condemned for it. But that would be my bit of proactivity to try and tackle it. Well, I want to conclude uh, <coughs> thanking you very, very much, but also you've referred several times today uh, to the responsibility to protect Ambassador Jones Perry and uh, Professor Ed Luck uh, of Columbia University and now of uh, the United Nations as well. I will be conducting a panel this coming Friday at 4.30 in 008 Bradley, which is in McKinney, uh, on exactly that subject, the responsibility to protect with particular reference to Kosovo. So I invite all of you to attend and please join me in warmly.